I've spent the last decade absolutely entrenched in container tooling. It's all I think about. Well, that and dogs, pizza. Now, with the 10 year anniversary of Amazon ECS and AWS Lambda, the AWS team reached out to sponsor this video. And I spent weeks getting reacquainted with these tools after leaving them for Kubernetes six years ago. That's right. I haven't used Amazon ECS or AWS Lambda since 2018, but they are still incredibly popular ways to run containerized applications and functions. I often get asked by my course students and consulting clients about how I prefer to run containers on AWS, of which there are so many ways. So many ways. After weeks of updating my skills with the latest features, I have some thoughts on these two serverless offerings from AWS and where they might and might not fit your toolkit. In 2017, AWS released Fargate as a way to make containers serverless on ECS. My goal for teams I work with today is that they never need to care about managing server instances or patching OSs. We're in the age of serverless as the default. I want my cloud to be responsible for the OS so my team can be more productive at higher levels in the stack. You can still run ECS without Fargate, but I see no reason to do that unless you need GPUs or more than 16 CPUs or above 120 gigs of memory per task. A task is what they call a pod in ECS. I can't help but look at ECS from the eyes of a Kubernetes operator who's also run a lot of swarm clusters, which means I know how complex an enterprise Kubernetes solution can be and how simple a swarm cluster can be. So with that in mind, here's some of my big takeaways after the last few weeks of ECSing and fargating. Simple and easy might be AWS App Runner or Amazon LightSail. That's two of the other ways you can run containers on AWS. ECS is not that, but it is something important. It's flexible and it's native. It's flexible because it's ideal for any long running container workload. If you need to isolate the container in a private subnet, ECS can do that. If you need thousands of containers running in parallel behind an ALB endpoint, it can do that. It has volume support for EBS, EFS, and even Windows file shares. It has built-in auto-scaling, health checks, batch jobs, startup dependency ordering, resource reservations and limits, Windows container support, Graviton support, and spot instance support. All of these features are just a few checkboxes away in their web UI. Or you could automate and deploy your ECS services in a growing list of tools outside of their web UI, including the AWS CLI with JSON documents that are similar to a Kubernetes resource manifest, or the AWS Copilot CLI, which I didn't get to use, but it looks pretty slick. Or the AWS CDK or Terraform, Pulumi, or their official GitHub actions. That's all to say for a serverless container solution, it's pretty flexible. Another important reason why ECS is attractive to me is that it feels native to AWS more than any other way I have run containers in AWS for a decade. It feels like it is the way you're supposed to run container orchestration while taking advantage of all the other AWS services. If you want to add a service mesh, the AWS native option Service Connect is a checkbox away. If you want to run a job workload, it uses AWS Batch to run those containers on ECS. It defaults to sending the logs to CloudWatch, but supports all the other ways you could essentially store your logs in AWS. It uses IAM roles, subnets, availability zones, load balancers, and public IPs like I would expect. It stores container secrets in Secret Manager, which is what I would expect the AWS to do. In fact, every one of these dozens of features and options feels like it was built just for AWS, because it was. It's an opinionated orchestrator, and I often prefer opinionated tools for getting the job done. With it being a proprietary orchestrator, it is a walled garden, and I think it's turned into a pretty great garden. I found myself very quickly getting productive with deploying my containers without having to research five different ways to solve a thing with a third-party tool. And that's the point. It's purpose-built. Okay, some quick advice if you want to check out ECS. Build your container images for multi-platform and use their ARM64 servers, Graviton, 
as well as spot instances to save money. Next, uh, enable Service Connect for your ECS services. This will place an Envoy Proxy sidecar in your tasks that, for one thing, gives you that friendly host name DNS ability like we have in Docker networks or in a Kubernetes namespace. Third, pay attention to your public and private subnets, internet gateways, security groups, and VPC routing tables. ECS still obeys all these traditional EC2 networking rules, and I made some wrong choices a few times that meant ECS couldn't even pull my container image from the internet. Lastly, since I had six years of catching up to do, I've provided a lot of my learning resources in the description below. Now let's shift to AWS Lambda, which from a complexity point of view is a night and day difference from ECS. If you want to create a function from the console UI, it only needs you to fill in the name, container image URL, the architecture type, and the IAM permissions role. That's it. Definitely developer friendly there. Note that Lambda doesn't run containers, but as of 2020, it can now use container images as a packaging format for deployment. I don't really get hung up on how Lambda runs the code, as in this case, it's really just a cloud implementation detail. What matters to me is that I can use the same build, test, and push workflows for functions in a container image as I do for my other container-based apps. Amazon ECS with AWS Fargate and AWS Lambda are both considered serverless, since we never provision servers or pay for unused resources. I see ECS and Lambda as complementary. You might have a microservice that is only used when it's triggered by something external, and maybe it doesn't take very long to run. That sounds like a great candidate to pull out of your ECS where it's an always-on container that you're paying for to sit there mostly idle and run that as a function. In the old days of 2018, if I thought I could save money by moving it to Lambda, I would have needed to likely refactor that microservice a little bit, bring it into a zip file that would only run on Lambda, and this was assuming it was a language and version supported by Lambda. That's a lot of ifs. Today, that story is much different. Container images are first-class artifacts in Lambda, and in many cases have a faster cold start time than zip files. Lambda supports much bigger apps in images, up to 10 gig. And because we're deploying a container image, we can run whatever language or runtime we want to run. Also, Lambda functions used to require special base images from AWS. But a few years ago, they released the AWS Lambda Web Adapter, which lets us build normal web server containers that we can run anywhere. And then we just copy the Web Adapter runtime binary into the image so it'll work as a Lambda function. A few tips here. One, you should use the Web Adapter whenever possible. Two, Build multi-platform images and choose the Graviton ARM architecture to save money. Three, in order to keep your Lambda deployments similar to your others, there are lots of options for automating deployments, including CloudFormation and AWS CDK, the AWS SAM CLI, which seems to be a favorite, Terraform, and many third-party GitHub Actions also work. Lastly, if you're already on Kubernetes and want to add Lambda function deployments, you can use Crossplane or the AWS controllers for Kubernetes to deploy lambdas just like they were a Kubernetes resource. I thought that one was pretty cool. Oh, and bonus, if you want to hear some real-world stories of Lambda in production, I had a podcast show with my co-host Nermo Mehta, a principal specialist solutions architect at AWS, and Ken Collins, an AWS serverless hero. Link's in the description. For those that want container orchestration for general workloads and are committed to AWS as their cloud, and aren't deeply entrenched in the Kubernetes ecosystem, I now think Amazon ECS with AWS Fargate is a solid contender for your chosen orchestrator. If you were to come to me and ask, which orchestrator would I recommend? It still would very much depend on your organization skill sets, future infrastructure plans, team size, and how deeply your commitment is to Kubernetes. But I think there's a level of simplicity with ECS and a synergy with AWS that can't be ignored. I'm betting that AWS Fargate will also reduce your infrastructure management overhead so you can spend more free time practicing your NeoVim keyboard skills. So many key bindings. For anyone writing event-driven function-style workloads for running on AWS, well, Lambda with container images is the way to go. The AWS Lambda web adapter makes these images useful outside of Lambda, so definitely check that out if you're going to use Lambda. Anyway, that's just a few of the ways you can run containers on AWS. Want to talk about it? 
Come join us on the Cloud Native Discord server, and thanks to the AWS team for sponsoring this video.